Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first uh, let me bid you all a very good morning and a warm welcome to the Singapore International Energy Week or SIU 2014. This is now the seventh year of SIU. It's been a very important platform, certainly from our perspective, and I think looking at the participation, I believe you agree with us. It is an important forum where policymakers, industry leaders, and thought leaders in the energy space come together to discuss the energy challenges of the day and also to consider possible strategies and solutions to address them. In recent times, we have uh, witnessed significant shifts in the energy sector arising from a surge, a veritable surge, really, in technological innovation. And one key innovation has been the success in extracting unconventional oil and gas. The abundant energy resource unlocked by this unconventional energy revolution has profoundly reshaped the future of our global energy mix, altered the balance of competitiveness in the global economy, and affected geopolitical dynamics. In light of these developments, many countries are impelled to reassess their energy policies and their strategies. The other big story is the rise of renewable energy. According to the 2014 BP Statistical Review of World Energy, renewables now account for more than 5% of global power output, and this sector continues to grow robustly. In particular, solar photovoltaic installations saw at least 38.4 gigawatts of new global capacity last year, a significant jump from previous years where it hovered around 30 gigawatts. This growth was fueled in part by the significant improvements of solar PV technology in terms of efficiency, size, and cost, making it a more viable component of any energy mix. Both innovations have been game changers and offer new alternatives, even as global energy demand and competition for energy resources continue to grow. And nowhere is the challenge of sourcing for secure, competitively priced, and clean energy more keenly felt than here in Asia, where many countries, including us here in Singapore, seek to meet growing domestic demand in a sustainable way. One measure of this challenge is evident in the EIA's International Energy Outlook 2013, which estimates that with global GDP rising by 3.6% per year, world energy use is expected to grow by 56% between 2010 and 2040, and significantly, about half of that increase is attributed to China and India. Against this backdrop of global energy developments and technological advancements, I think it is opposite that the theme of this year's SIEW is building energy connections. It emphasizes how integration of energy networks holds the potential to positively shape our energy future and sustain the global quest for secure energy supplies. For example, there have been discussions on establishing an Asian tra gas trading hub, which could benefit Asian gas consumers if it is able to better address regional gas demand and supply fundamentals while leveraging on global arbitrage opportunities. SIU continues to provide a platform to build such energy connections that can foster collaboration amongst our officials, business leaders, and experts. And we hope that it will yield valuable solutions. To open this year's uh, SIEW discussions, I would like to share with you some of the strategies and initiatives that Singapore has adopted in order to make our own energy landscape more secure, competitive, and dynamic. A key plank of our energy strategy is to diversify our energy sources and enhance our access to secure and cost-competitive sources of energy. We support ASEAN's efforts in that regard to strengthen regional energy security through interconnectivity projects such as the Trans-ASEAN Gas Pipeline and the ASEAN Power Grid. Beyond bilateral links, there is much potential for ASEAN countries to explore multilateral interconnections, and we are taking 
specific steps in that direction. For example, under the Lao PDR, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore Power Integration Project, the four ASEAN countries are embarking on a pilot study to assess the technical viability of cross-border power trade of up to 100 megawatts from Lao PDR to Singapore through existing interconnections, as well as the policy and regulatory, legal, and commercial aspects which could affect cross-border electricity movement. This will complement existing efforts towards realizing the ASEAN power grid. Domestically, we are taking steps to expand our liquefied natural gas infrastructure. We currently have three tanks at our LNG terminal on Jurong Island, which commenced operations last year. In August this year, the terminal operator, SLNG, awarded a contract for the fourth tank, and it was awarded to Samsung CNT. This will raise the terminal's throughput capacity from the current 6 million tons per annum to around 11 million tons per annum by 2017. In the longer term, the terminal's capacity can be expanded to 15 million tons per annum. We have also announced plans to develop a second LNG terminal, and we are studying potential sites in the eastern part of Singapore for that purpose. It will help to ensure that we have sufficient infrastructural capacity to accommodate our domestic gas demand as well as associated activities in the long run. Beyond our LNG infrastructure, we have also put in place a competitive process to secure new LNG supplies for Singapore. Under the competitive licensing framework, we will import LNG on a tranche-by-tranche -tranche basis to meet incremental demand. The Energy Market Authority of Singapore has launched a request for proposal exercise to invite importers to submit proposals to supply Singapore's next tranche of LNG. It has elicited strong interest from industry players, many of whom are represented here today, and we look forward to competitive bids from interested parties. Access to secure and cost-competitive natural gas supplies is a policy objective shared by many countries, especially in Asia. And there will be more opportunities to discuss the underlying drivers of, the, of Asia's gas market, as well as the strategic and commercial challenges faced throughout the region at the third Gas Asia Summit, which will be held later this week. The seventh Downstream and Petrochemical Asia Conference will also provide an opportunity to consider the impact of global developments, such as the shale gas revolution, on the region's leading oil and gas, refining, and petrochemical industry players. Notwithstanding our physical and resources limitations, in Singapore, we continue to also explore other options to further diversify our energy mix. In particular, our efforts are focused on solar technology and scaling up its deployment, as it is the most viable renewable energy option for Singapore at this stage. Our government agencies are taking the lead through the Solar Nova program, which aggregates solar demand across government buildings and spaces to yield cost savings from economies of scale. Solar Nova is making good progress, and we expect the first aggregated tender to be launched in early 2015. We have also enhanced the regulatory framework to facilitate greater integration of intermittent generation sources, such as solar, into our energy system. And to ensure that grid connection process is smooth and expedient, a task force comprising the Energy Market Authority and SP Power Grid has shortened the grid connection process for solar PV installations from 27 to 7 working days. And they have also eased administrative requirements imposed on solar PV owners and developed a one-stop information portal to share know-how on solar licensing and technical requirements. In addition, we are investing in research, development, and demonstration to develop innovative, cost-effective solutions to support the integration of intermittent solar energy while maintaining the overall stability of the grid. For example, 
the Energy Innovation Program Office supports competitive R&D projects in smart grids, energy analytics, and control systems. Energy storage is an emerging area that has the potential to help manage solar intermittency. As such, the Energy Market Authority of Singapore will be establishing a new $25 million energy storage program under the Energy National Innovation Challenge to develop technologies that can enhance the overall stability and resilience of the power system. The funds will support the development and integration of large-scale cost-effective systems for Singapore's power system. And this will help meet domestic needs as well as generate economic opportunities through the development of export solutions and capability or exportable solutions and capabilities. In tandem with the growth and adoption of renewable energy, there is heightened interest in the governance and financing of the sector. And there will be opportunities to address these issues at Renewables at SIU, which is hosting a suite of conferences and exhibitions such as the European Union Business Avenues Clean Technologies, ASEAN Clean Energy, Asian, sorry, Clean Energy Summit, and RE at SIU. Another important component of our strategy in the energy sector is to progressively increase competition in the electricity retail market so that consumers will have more choice and options to manage their energy cost. This year, we lowered the contestability threshold in phases for commercial and industrial consumers from 10 megawatt hours to 8 megawatt hours on 1st April, and then to 4 megawatt hours on the 1st of October. This move has benefited about 15,000 or more commercial and industrial consumers who can now choose to buy electricity from retailers who offer different pricing plans and packages as alternatives to the regulated tariff. To enable even more consumers to benefit from this contestability, we will lower the threshold further to two megawatt hours from July 1st next year. This will enable an additional at least 10,000 more commercial and industrial consumers to be able to negotiate for retail packages at competitive prices. Our goal is to progressively liberalize the electricity market so that all our consumers, a number of about 1.3 million, from households to businesses, will enjoy the same flexibility and choice. We have also had some efforts focusing on the business environment and how we can help to lower energy and compliance costs for businesses, especially our small and medium enterprises. In that regard, EMA formed a task force to review all its rules and licensing requirements with the objective of reducing costs and enhancing flexibility for businesses without compromising safety standards. Following the review, EMA will be simplifying around 70 of its rules and regulatory requirements so as to streamline information and reporting requirements and to make the application processes for gas and electricity licenses less onerous. These changes will benefit not only existing and new electricity and gas licensees, but also many consumers who will potentially benefit from lower compliance costs and improved service standards. One specific enhancement pertains to the application requirements for skilled and experienced mature workers seeking to undertake electrical or gas service works. And this takes on particular importance in the context of our workforce, which is aging as a demographic trend. EMA will share more details on this and other changes through its industry platforms and communication channels. EMA is also working with Singapore Power to review the rules, requirements, and procedures of SP services and SP Power Grid, which affect businesses such as the application processes for electricity and gas connections. I want to say a few words on our focus on developing manpower capabilities because this, we feel, is a key thrust in terms of sustaining our energy future. To that end, EMA has worked closely with the industry to raise professionalism, develop competencies, 
and provide opportunities for skills upgrading. Last year, the government accepted the recommendations of the Power Sector Manpower Task Force, which was led by Mr. Kwek Bo Huat, Senior Advisor from Singapore Power. And I'm pleased to share with you that Singapore Power has taken the lead to implement one of the task force key recommendations, which was to coordinate the training needs for Singapore's power sector by establishing the Singapore Institute of Power and Gas, or SIPG for short. SIPG has the support of all major power industry players who are working together to help shape its curriculum and course offerings. The aim is to establish SIPG as a center of excellence in providing training for the power sector. SIPG will expand its range of causes over time to include emerging areas such as energy storage, installation, and maintenance of solar panels. Beyond Singapore, SIPG also seeks to eventually train and develop power sector employees from the region. In support of this important initiative, EMA will co-fund the initial establishment of the SIPG, and also EMA has established a $20 million energy training fund to support the training needs of Singaporean workers from the power sector. And this can potentially include professional development courses offered by SIPG. This will boost efforts to build a strong Singaporean core of technical professionals with the skills to meet the needs of the power sector. Our capacity building efforts also aim to excite our youth to think about the challenges in this dynamic sector and inspire them to consider career choices in this space. One initiative in that context is the event entitled In Dialogue with Youth. It will be held later this week as part of CU 2014 and present an opportunity to engage youths from our schools and institutes of higher learning on the challenges and opportunities in the energy sector. And I would invite those of you who are interested to join us at this, what promises to be an interesting session. So let me round up by stressing, energy clearly is a crucial resource for any economy. And what I have endeavored to do is share with you some of the more recent initiatives in Singapore to diversify our energy sources, foster greater competition in the electricity market, reduce costs and enhance flexibility for businesses, as well as to develop our manpower capacity and capabilities. These are but some examples, certainly from the Singapore context, of the strategies and solutions that have been adopted around the world in response to energy challenges that are being faced by individual countries. Active discussions among energy professionals, policymakers, and industry players, especially at forums like SU, at the SU Summit and other SU events, are crucial because they will enable us to learn more from one another, emulate best practices, and formulate robust energy policies that can underpin the competitiveness and growth of our economies. So I urge all of you to make full, take full advantage of the various platforms and fora we have as part of CU 2014, and I wish all of you a very fruitful and productive week ahead. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Minister.